the story of Jesus' birth. But long before the birth of Jesus, God began writing this greatest story through the writings he gave to the Old Testament prophets of this miraculous gift of Christmas that was to come. So last week we looked at some of those prophecies. This week we turn to the Gospels. And the Gospels of Matthew and Luke tell us all we know about the birth of Jesus. There's no birth narrative in Mark, and John's is more of a spiritual narrative in the, in the prologue to John's Gospel, but it's not a historical narrative. Now Luke's narrative is more detailed than Matthew's, and it begins at an earlier point. So we might consider Luke's account as a historical beginning and that Luke effectively wrote the very first words of the Gospels in the New Testament. So today we're going to read uh, from Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 20 and 57 through 66, beginning on page 1589. But I'm going to be reading it in the sermon, so I'm not going to read it all of a piece. But if you want to put your finger in that page when we get to those and read along, you can do that as well. Now with Luke effectively being the very first words of the New Testament, as far as the narrative, even though Mark's gospel is older, so he wrote, he wrote his gospel first, but Luke goes back farther. But before that, the prophet Malachi wrote the very last words of the Old Testament, and his words had direct bearing on what Luke wrote. In the power of the Holy Spirit, Malachi wrote a final prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. That's Malachi 3, 1, and 4, 5 through 6. And this would be God's final word until 400 years later, the promised prophet would appear. So I want you to keep this passage in mind as we read Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25, but I'm going to start with the first 13 verses. In the time of Herod the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. They were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Once Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God. He was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Well, very near the end of the reign of the wicked King Herod, a priest named Zechariah, in the order of Abijah, was on duty with his division in the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. Now, Zechariah, whose name in Hebrew means God has remembered, was part of the fulfillment of God's prophecy through Malachi. And so God remembered his promise to Malachi and chose Zechariah to embody the fulfillment of it. Zechariah was a Levite, a member of the priesthood and a descendant of Moses' brother Aaron. The priestly class was divided into 24 units and each group was called up from their respective towns to Jerusalem to serve twice a year for a week in the temple. Zechariah lived in a town in the hill country of Judea, and he had traveled to Jerusalem to fulfill his priestly duty with his order of priests. And while serving there, the priests would draw lots for the once-in-a-lifetime honor to enter the holy sanctuary 
and offer incense to the Lord, while the other priests waited outside praying. So finally, in his old age, we're told that he's very old, Zechariah was chosen for this honor. When he entered the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared at the right side of the altar. Not your usual occurrence, apparently. Mm -hmm. Zechariah responded in the very same way as the prophet Daniel when he came face to face with the very same angel. He was terrified. But the angel reassured Zechariah, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been answered. And so the angel's words were the very first spoken in the New Testament and could well have been addressed to all those prayers that had been lifted up to God in the 400 years of silence since God last spoke to Israel. Do not be afraid, O people of Israel, for your prayer has been heard. As Zechariah burned incense before the Lord in his temple, he himself represented the whole nation of Israel. That was the purpose of the priest, to come before the Lord in the holy place and pray on behalf of the nation and burn the incense. Perhaps the angel was prompting Zechariah to remember the words of his Old Testament namesake, the prophet Zechariah, who was contemporaneous with Malachi. The Lord said through Zechariah the prophet, now I have determined to do good again to Jerusalem and Judah. Do not be afraid. That's Zechariah 8.15. So the angel who stood before Zechariah the priest in the temple sanctuary gave the very same assurance that he gave to Zechariah the prophet. Do not be afraid. Zechariah was about to hear personal good news in response to his prayers. God would give him a long-awaited son. And he was, as the representative of Israel, before the altar of the Lord, about to hear the good news promised by God to the nation of Israel. God would give them the long-awaited Messiah. But Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, who were told is also a descendant of the first priest of Israel, Aaron, they had no children. And they were getting on in years. And yet daily they had prayed for a son. Both Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in the sight of the Lord, observing all the commands and the decrees of the Lord blamelessly. Now children were looked upon as great blessings in fulfillment of God's covenant, to provide an heir, to carry on the family line, to care for parents in their old age. And for Elizabeth and Zechariah, who were as close to sinless as humanly possible, childlessness was an even greater disgrace, painful, despite their pious living. It would appear like a harsh and, harsh and undeserved divine judgment. And the lack of the son for Zechariah also meant that his place as a priest of God in the line of Aaron would die with him. To both Zechariah and Elizabeth, their extended family and their village, everybody who knew them, it would seem that God had singled them out for punishment that in an instant all that would change. Reading on in verses 13 through 17, the angel said to him, your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. And he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah and Elizabeth would have a son. This son would be a joy and a delight to this couple who had waited a lifetime for this child. But this son would also cause many to rejoice because of his birth. This child would be great in the sight of the Lord. And that's, that's a stupendous statement right there. This child would be dedicated to the Lord as a Nazarite and would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Even before he would be born, he would be set apart for God. 
This was no ordinary child. He's the fulfillment of the prophets. And the angel left no doubt of this as he directly quoted God's words to Malachi. I read them to you earlier. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That would be his ministry. So this child of Zechariah and Elizabeth would be the forerunner, preparing the way for the Messiah. Now surely Je Zechariah, you got to think about this man. He was trained as a learned priest of God, knowledgeable in the scriptures. He would have recognized the prophet's words applied by the angel of the Lord to his promised son in the air. He would have known Malachi. And surely he must have remembered Father Abraham and how God gave a son to him when he was 100 and Sarah was 90. Surely Zechariah knew nothing was impossible for God. Not miracles, nor the power to send a divine messenger to his own temple to deliver this momentous news to Zechariah. What would you do at this moment? Think about it. Would you shout hallelujah? Would you fall on your face before this angelic messenger? I mean, I'd probably just, you know, weak knee, go right down. What did Zechariah do? Did he thank God for this marvelous gift? Did he praise God? Did he remember his training as a priest and his knowledge of the scriptures? Did he forget about God's promise and the gift to Abraham of a son in his old age? Did he really believe that nothing is impossible with God? No, he didn't do any of these things. Zechariah dared to question God, and his question revealed that despite his calling to be God's priest, and all of his learning, and all of his experience, his faith was lacking. He wanted to know more. He wanted to know the hows and the whys and the whens of God's plan instead of trusting God's word. And so this is what he said. How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. Almost word for word, Zechariah repeats Abraham's question to the heavenly visitors who announced that Isaac would be born. But Abraham's question seemed to be all that Zechariah remembered. Not God's fulfillment of the promise in the birth of Isaac, nor the promise to the world that Abraham's children represented, nor the promise that the Messiah would come through Abraham. It seems that years and years of serving in and around the temple as God's priest were nothing more than going through the motions for Zechariah. Had he ever really expected to encounter God? He didn't seem to believe it even when it happened. And as their priest, Zechariah, he represented the people, the whole nation of Israel before God. Perhaps his unbelief mirrored the spiritual condition of the nation at this time. So he dared to ask the question. It's a really dumb question concerning what Zechariah knew about God. The angel answers him. And scripture doesn't tell us what the angel's tone of voice was, but I imagine it might have been just like thunder. My name is Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. Could he believe that? Zechariah stood in the presence of Gabriel. Gabriel, the same heavenly messenger who had twice appeared to the prophet Daniel. Gabriel, one of two archangels who stood in the very presence of God Almighty, standing at the ready to be God's unique and powerful messenger and emissary. He was standing before Zechariah. There was no doubt that this angel's words would come to pass. Zechariah would come to regret his dumb question and see how dumb it really was in God's eyes because Gabriel continued, and now you will be silent and not able to speak until the, the day that this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true in their appointed time. 
So Zechariah's dumb question left him dumbstruck. And he would be unable to speak until the day of John's circumcision when the child would be dedicated to the Lord. The Archangel Gabriel brought great good news to Zechariah, and he would not even be able to tell anyone about it. But the good news was more than this personal message for Zechariah. Whenever we read this phrase, good news, or the good news, in Scripture, it's the Greek word euangelion, from which we get the word evangelical. It means the gospel. That's what the good news is, the great good news of God's promise that's coming into fulfillment. And so the good news that Zechariah heard was not merely about the birth of his own son. It was the good news that after Zechariah's son, God would be sending his own son. And though Zech so Zechariah had been preparing all his life for this moment, because every priest hoped that they would have an encounter with God, he was not prepared to hear this good news. Well, Zechariah, he came out of the presence of the Lord that day, and as if in atonement for the face, faceless nation, he remained speechless for nine months, a silence that echoed the 400 years which followed God's last words to his people through Malachi. Zechariah wasn't ready, and the people of Israel were still not ready for God's Messiah. But God was ready. Remembering his covenant promises, God chose Zechariah, a priest righteous in his sight, whose name means God remembers. And out of his gracious love to his people, he sent John, whose name means God is gracious. And John would be the forerunner who would prepare the way for the Lord, who would be his Messiah, Yeshua, whose name means God saves. And when a son is born, just at the right time, God determined his mother and father would give him the name that God had chosen, John. Mm -hmm. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. And they said to her, There's no one among your relatives who has that name. And then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. And so he asked for a writing tablet, but to everyone's astonishment, he wrote his name as John. And immediately his mouth was opened, and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. And all the neighbors were filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking all about these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. Let us pray. Father God, as we begin the journey of Advent this year, may we remember that you are the God who remembers his covenant, his promises to his people. We are reminded in the story of the birth of John that at just the right time you sent him, whose name means God is gracious, out of the great and gracious love you have for the world. Help us to be a people of anticipation of your great works of grace for us, your children. May we be ever mindful that nothing is too small to escape your notice, and nothing is too great for your powerful love to accomplish, for nothing is impossible with you. Heavenly Father, you sent John to be the one who came before your son, Yeshua, to prepare your people for the salvation that he would bring. During these weeks of Advent, help us to prepare our hearts to receive Jesus anew, and ready us for the calling he has on our lives, to be the witnesses of his love and salvation to a world so desperately in need of saving. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, 
our Savior. Amen. Amen. Amen.